Hey, if I hadn't met you yet, my name's Spencer. Uh, glad to be with y'all, man. Y'all are, y'all are our people. I love hanging out with folks that understand youth and youth ministry. It's so refreshing to have adults here. It's, uh, it's awesome. Uh, hey, y'all turn to the book of Jude. Uh, if y'all don't know, we're going into a crazy passage. So get ready for it. But hey, I thought y'all would enjoy this. Uh, y'all understand. Y'all work with middle schoolers, right? Uh, I've got, I got three kids. I got a high schooler and two middle schoolers, and so my wife is out of town, and uh, she's out of town with my high schooler, so the coalition for reason at my house is very slim, and so uh, my two middle schoolers last night, I'm here, they're at the house, and uh, to protect the guilty, I won't tell you the names, but uh, one of my kids calls and says, hey, uh, everything's cool, uh, but uh, I won't say the name, but my sibling uh, started a little fire upstairs where everything's cool, and I put it out, and you don't need to come home. <laughs> and I was like, you know, I'm, I'm going I'm to come home. I'm, a go, I'm just going just gonna to see what's happening. And he's, dang it. Uh, they were right. Uh, I'll have to strike that one from the podcast. They won't listen to this. Uh, yeah, everything was cool. But, yeah, man, y'all. Ministering to teenagers is weird. It's hard. Y'all know in one night, you guys, whether you're a small group leader or the person that preaches or, you know, a volunteer, you're, you're up there. You're sharing. I mean, you're, you've studied. You're sharing the word. And then you turn around. You're dealing with, like, a real family tragedy, a difficult situation. And then you're fielding questions like, are there dinosaurs in the Bible? And then you're telling a kid, hey, you need to shower more, like, and, and then you take 30 kids home that night, get home at midnight, and you're like, the heck just happened, like, that is not JV, that is varsity, you guys are it, man, and y'all are, and the perception is that y'all play video games and work on Wednesdays, man, we love you guys, y'all, y'all are in the trenches, man, I want to help you guys be equipped, and I, man, I, last night was so good, because Rob was just talking about, hey, pause, before you are a minister, you are called beloved and kept man hopefully you, hopefully you, that resonated with you that your identity isn't youth leader or small group leader your identity is i'm in christ that you just pause in that and realize he loved me he called me and now he's keeping me man that is good that's so good and to be honest i would love to preach that again but i can't and Jude shifts gears just like that. So go to Jude, verse 3. He says, he says that too. He says, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to appealing to you to contend for the faith. He's saying the same thing I'm saying. Hey, you know what? I would love to just talk about how you are called, beloved, and kept, and how grace and peace are multiplied, but we got some business. We got to go. And he says, verse 4, because the reason I've got to ask you to contend for the faith is because certain people have crept in unnoticed, meaning to the church. He says certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. People are coming into the church now, it's been warned a long time ago. Uh, we'll put it up on the board. You don't have to turn there. But Acts, Paul warns the church. Uh, this is when he's meeting with the, uh, the elders of Ephesus at Miletus, and he's warning them. And he says, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away uh, disciples after them. Paul's saying, hey, after I leave, the wolves are coming. They're coming in with you. Now, Peter speaks of this in 2 Peter. He says this, False prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing on themselves swift destruction. Many will follow sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed, and in their greed they'll exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. Paul says, hey, when I leave, they're... They're going to come in the future. Peter says, oh, they're near. And now Jude, when, when he's writing, he's saying, they're here. They're among you. Y'all, y'all had to read that. Uh, y'all remember those Jack London books, uh, White Fang or, or Call of the Wild? Y'all remember those books? 
If not, if you're a 90s kid, you remember the movie with Ethan Hawke in it, the White Fang movie? I used to love that movie. That was so good. Well, there's one scene. It's in the first real chapter of the book where, uh, you know, Paul's talking about wolves here. There's a, a scene in that where, okay, you got two guys. They're in the Yukon, like, like way, way, way up north, and they're on a dog sled. And they're bringing the body of their friend back to his, like, to his home place to bury him. Y'all, y'all familiar with this story? So they're traveling like on a dog sled with a casket. And it's these two guys. And every night they got these dangers. They got, you know, bears. They got the cold. But the big thing they're worried about is the wolves. And in the first chapter, it's kind of like the, the nightmare comes true in this White Fang book. Because they go, the one guy goes out to feed the dogs at night. He's got six sled dogs, and he's got six fish. And so he goes out there. You know, they got the fires blazing, so no wolves are coming around. And he feeds, you know, one fish, one dog, one fish, second dog, third dog, fourth dog, fifth dog, sixth dog. And he looks, and he sees one of his dogs right here. And he's like, what the heck? And so he goes back to his friend. He's like, hey, six dogs, right? We got six dogs. And the guy's like, yeah, six dogs. And he's like, well, I had six fish, and I fed Oh, my gosh. And they realize there's a wolf that's among the dogs. And the whole scene goes into chaos from there because there's a wolf among them. That's what Jude is saying here. He's saying, man, I'd love to write to you more about called, beloved, and kept, but there are wolves. They are not coming. They are here. And their goal, he said here, ungodly people who, here's their goals, pervert the grace of our God into sensuality, And deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. This is an intentional leading people away. And so Jude's saying to us as ministers of the gospel, you got to fight. You have to contend for the faith. And and I would say specifically to you guys, man, y'all, y'all are shepherding teenagers. Y'all are shepherding teenagers. And you think, could there be wolves in my church? Yeah, there could be wolves in your church. But I think one danger for teenagers is there are wolves in the the church large. And the dangerous part about our times is the wolf doesn't have to be in your physical church. Your students could be hearing false teaching that's in a church in Houston, that's in a church in wherever. There are wolves that your teens might be hearing. And y'all know, if you think about how a literal wolf acts, you know who they're not attacking? The strong. You know, they, they come up on a, uh, a group of deer. They're not targeting the biggest buck. They're attacking the slowest fawn, you know. They're going after the weak, the young, the new believers. Now, now you and I both know that one reason you're in youth ministry is like, man, if these guys get passionate about the Lord, it's on. Like, there's no stopping it. They, God can use teenagers to change the world. There's nothing like the zeal of a 15-year-old group of girls like that are on fire for the Lord. There's nothing like that. But at the same time, you know, middle school and high schoolers, they're easily swayed. They're convinced. They turn, I mean, drop of the hat, they'll turn. And, and what's dangerous is that these guys, they're not going to recognize false teachers. They're not going to, if they recognize it, they're not going to know how to, how to attack that, how to fight off a wolf. And so we're going to have to. And so that's why I say youth ministry is not JV, it's varsity. You know, you guys are taking difficult biblical truths and trying to put it on the level of a sixth grade boy. That's hard to do. And on top of that, you're having to spot and attack wolves that are among the flock. You're, you've got to protect them spiritually as a good under-shepherd. No matter if you're the person delivering the, the, the message or if you're the person explaining the message in small groups, you're an under-shepherd. And so this passage here, Jude is telling us, hey, love to talk about the gospel. Hey, I got to talk to you about the wolves. I got to talk to you about the ones that are coming in. So this passage is really how to spot a wolf, how to recognize it. Now, pause for a second. I'm not interested in specific call-outs. I'm not interested in, you know, a lot of people, they get a lot out of, like, calling a person out and saying, here's how their teaching's false, whatever. That's going to shift. You know, five years from now, the teaching's going to be a little bit different, a little bit different. So he's going to give us timeless characteristics so that we can spot a wolf in five years, in 10 years, in 15 years. These are timeless characteristics from the Scripture. Now, I don't want to nerd out too hard, but, like, the way Jude is written, it's beautiful. 
It's in sections of three, 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 three. Everything's in three. You'll just recognize it as you go. And he's going to talk about three groups and then three characteristics. And then he's going to keep on going in these groups of three so that we, we can remember what a wolf looks like. You guys good? All right, we're going to have to dive into some super obscure Old Testament stories. I'm going to go as quick as I can, and you might have to double back and, like, refresh yourself on some of these stories. But, uh, all right, we'll jump in. Verse 5. Now, I want to remind you. He's going to talk about these three groups. I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who's, here's group number one, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Here's group two, verse six. The angels who did not stay within their own position of authority but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Here's group three. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. All right. It's hard to study through this passage and be like, what is he saying? What, what do we just do? Like, it's a reminder, right? One of the most consistent accusations against God's people is they didn't remember. And so he's bringing up these three groups in history, the Jews, the angels, and the Gentiles. These specific groups of Jews, specific angels, specific Gentiles. And he's saying, here's how to spot a wolf. All right, if we are, and I, I want to take a lot of time on this because we got to roll into some obscure passages. <clears throat> but if we're to look into what, how to spot a literal wolf, like an actual run around on all fours, versus a dog, there are some things you could look at. We're going to put a picture on the board, all right? Picture of a dog versus a wolf. Like when you think about the characteristics, you got to look at the physical and you got to look at the behavior. So as far as the physical goes, you know, your dog, like uh, I got a lab at home. I got too many dogs. Your dog at home, they, have, they actually have a wider uh, chest and wider hips than a wolf. A wolf is a lot narrower through the chest and the hips. There's a difference in how they run. A dog will kind of bob along while a wolf runs head down and it kind of darts. You know, the eye color is different between a wolf and a dog. Y'all got dogs at home? Some of y'all? What color are their eyes? Brown. You know, you got some that are blue. Y'all seen those really cool blue eyed dogs? A wolf, their eyes are always yellow or amber, like a, a shade of yellow. Oh, their eyes are always yellow. Now, when you think about their physical, as you continue on, like a wolf's head in proportion to his body is much bigger than a dog's. A wolf's legs are much longer. They got a narrow chest, narrow hips, and their, their actual, like their jaw and skull, they got the same number of teeth, but their jaw and skull is about twice as dense. They're built for crushing. And so, you know, they share about 99% of the DNA with a dog, but wolves are different. And if you start looking at their behavior, you can start seeing the real difference. Because, like, we had that picture, like, if you were to take the lab out of that picture, you might say, that's a cool dog, or maybe that's a wolf. If you're just to see a wolf by itself, uh, just a still snapshot of one, it might be hard to tell. Is that a wolf or is that a husky? But if you start looking at their behavior, you know, a dog can breed multiple times a year. A wolf can only breed once a year. Wolf puppies will mature a lot faster than dogs. You know, I, okay, if you want to fascinate, on your way home, look up on YouTube, wolf versus dog behavior. It's fascinating. I, I watched this one where, um, you know, dogs rely on humans. Wolves do not. So they did this one where they had a fence, and under the fence they had ropes connected to pieces of cheese or a rope next to a piece of cheese. And so the dog, when it ran upon this problem to solve, it run up to the fence and then look at the human like, hey, man, what, what am I supposed to do here? The wolf never looked at the humans. The wolf would go straight and look at the rope, look at the cheese, look at the rope, look at the cheese. Nine times out of ten, they'd choose the right one. The dog would look at the human, and then finally he'd choose one. And when they chose, like, let's say the right one, he would almost always just keep choosing the same thing over and over and over. Their behavior is very different. So you have to look close, not just at their physical characteristics. You've got to look close at their behavior because it's hard to tell. All right. When Jude is talking about these false teachers, he's saying you've got to look close. How they look, how they act, because history, we don't want history to repeat itself. These guys, there's nothing new under the sun. It's going to repeat. So here are the three groups, all right? The three groups, look how they act. Group number one, he says, some Jews, here's how the wolves act, some Jews sought God work in Egypt, 
and chose not to believe. God was with them. They saw the plagues. They saw the clouds. They saw the mountain, and they rejected belief and were destroyed. That's group one. Group two, some angels, look at how they act. Some angels saw God in heaven and didn't remain, but they chose to rebel and live sensually. There's a part of this that plays out sexually. They left their position of authority, and they wanted to judge and be an authority in themselves. They'll eventually be destroyed. Group number three, look how they act. Some Gentiles rebelled sexually in Sodom and Gomorrah. Not just sexual immorality, but unnatural desire. They chose it, they pursued it, and they were punished. What is Jude saying with these three groups? There are some who saw God and rejected. There's some who hear God's laws and reject. There's some who reject God's intent for sexuality and pursue unnatural desire. And here in this story, it's homosexuality. And he says all three of these groups are destroyed for what they do. Why is Jude bringing up these old stories? They're for us right now so we can recognize in 2024 wolves in the church. He says, yeah, there, there are people who are going to see God act and decide, yes, I see that, but I'm not going to follow him. People that are going to hear and understand God's laws and decide, okay, I see that, but I'm going to do my own thing. People that hear God's plan for sexuality and say, eh, but this is going to make me happier. Two goals of a wolf, deny Jesus and turn his grace into sexuality. Now, we know the culture is repeating these mistakes wholeheartedly. You know what I mean? That's, just the, that's what the culture is going to do. Like just the world, what, I mean... <laughs> for real if any culture can be said to pursue unnatural desire it's our culture i mean for real we literally celebrate sexual immorality we give literal awards for breaking god's laws about we applaud it unnatural desire is all around us i mean we don't have to give all these examples they're not just simply tolerated they're celebrated in our culture but you know what here's the thing non-christians are going to act like non-christians that's just it. You know, my kids go to public school. All the time they're coming home and being like, man, these guys, like, they're sending news. They're, they're, they're you know, all, all these perverted things. <laughs> okay, pause. Uh, my, my daughter, this is two years ago. My daughter, uh, she joined a new basketball team. And uh, I was asking her about it. And I was like, hey, what would you think of those girls? You like those girls? They, they're pretty cool. And she's like, ah, they're really perverted. And I was like, oh. Because she had done layups in the line with him. I was like, how did they have time to? And I was like, what, how did you, wh- what do you mean they're really perverted? She's like, they don't talk at all. And I said, perverted? She said, yeah, they're so quiet. I said, you mean introverted? And she goes, yes, introverted. <laughs> Perverts. But, uh, but for real, like, when my kids are at school and they're like, hey, these kids are, I mean, y'all know, y'all see, y'all see kids, I mean, all the time. And I tell my kids, I'm like, hey, lost people are going to act lost. That's it. Lost people are going to act lost. That's not what Jude's talking about here. He's not saying, hey, people are perverted out there. People are choosing things other than the Lord. What he's saying is, warning, these guys are on purpose infiltrating the church to lead people astray. Be on your guard. Here's what a wolf looks like in your church. They follow a pattern that they kind of look like they're of God, but they're not. And they're deceiving those that are. How does one kind of look like they're of God? Well, they say some true things and some deadly things. They lead people towards God, kind of, and also towards sexual sin. They lead people towards God and also to gain at any cost. Towards God and also towards unbelief. Their aim, their goal is to pervert the grace of God and deny the lordship of Jesus. Jude goes on, I got to hustle. Jude goes on to tell us, he, that was kind of like what wolves look like. And now he's going to tell us the behavior, how they act, all right? Uh, and he's going to give three behaviors. He says, verse 8, yet in like manner, these people also, here's the three behaviors. Another set of three. Relying on their dreams, they defile the flesh, they reject authority, and they blaspheme the glorious ones. What he's saying is, the wolves in 2024 are going to act like this. They're going to follow these same patterns. Relying on their dreams. Y'all, y'all know dreams are messed up. The, not last night, but the night before, I dreamed that me and D'Angelo Russell, y'all know who he is? He plays for the Lakers. Me and D'Angelo Russell were defending this building against intruders. It was awesome. <laughs> he was wearing his full Lakers uniform, and I was like, let's go. Uh, like, the heck is that? 
You wake up all the time and you'd be like, there's something wrong with me personally. I dreamed I was, a lot of my dreams had to do with basketball. Uh, I dreamed I was crossing up a tomato uh, not long ago. Like that, not that I was dribbling a tomato, that a tomato was guarding me. And I was like, got him. Uh, like, and I woke up like, first off, I woke up like, all right, there's something wrong with me. And second, I was like, heck yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> but he's saying relying on their dreams. Yeah, you can't rely on your dreams. I think he's expanding that to say relying on their feelings, relying on their impulses. Man, y'all know if someone says, hey, God told me, or somebody says, I feel like God says, or I have a vision, I have a word from the Lord, they can be some of the most dangerous sentence starters on earth. You know what I mean? And the irony here is Jude saying, some people are elevating their dreams and their feelings and their impulses over the word of God. This is happening. This is a pattern that these wolves will come in and they'll elevate their own thoughts and feelings over God's authority, just like the angels, just like, you know what I'm saying, this following the same thing. And our culture thinks, even our church culture thinks, today this is so new, this is so woke, this is so fresh. It's a rerun. It's a rerun, man. What is has been. And with disastrous results. All right, we're going to get into the weirdest of the weird of this passage. Y'all ready? Are y'all hanging with me? Okay. Uh, He's he's going to keep on with the identifying the wolves, and it's so important that he does it. Verse nine. This gets into weird stuff. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, "The Lord rebuke you." But these people, these wolves. They blaspheme everything they don't understand, and they're destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. That is a complex passage. Go unpack it later on. But moral of the story, he's saying they're like animals. They operate on instinct alone. Instinct alone. Whatever feels good, let's do it. Y'all got middle schoolers like this, right? All the time we see middle schoolers at the snack shack. They got $100 from mama. I mean, I saw this kid, my favorite kid. He was at the snack shack sitting totally by himself, two cans of Pringles, two cans of Monster Drink, Taki dust smeared on his face like this, little butt crack hanging out. 6 p.m., he still got bedhead, and I was like, hey, buddy. <laughs> and he's like, there's pretty girls around. He's, he doesn't even care yet. He's of that age, you know? And I was like, you good? And he's panic drinking Monster Drinks. Like, <laughs> and I was like, you're right, and he's like, "Yeah, it's my third one tonight. My mom gave me a hundred dollars." <laughs> and so I was like, "All right, buddy, stay alive, okay?" Because <laughs> y'all know middle schoolers, they act out of instinct. You know what I mean? And that's what that's what Jude is saying about these false teachers: is they're not following authority; they're following instinct. And what's dangerous is that our teenagers might be being steered by somebody who's just following instinct. We have to teach them we follow Jesus. He is the anchor in these shifting times. Verse 11. He's going to get even more obscure, and then we're going to surface, all right? He gives three more examples. These are individual but obscure. It's like detail in a wolf's eyes, a wolf's feet. Verse 11. Woe to them. They walked in the way of Cain, that's example one. They abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error, and they perished in Korah's rebellion. Three more examples of false teachers. Now, we don't have time to go into all these. Let me give you bird's eye view. Y'all remember Cain. He made this sacrifice to the Lord, and the Lord had no regard for Cain and his offering. And so Cain, instead of repenting, got mad. And the Lord said, why are you mad? If you do well, won't things go great for you? But if you don't, sin is crouching at the door and it wants to take over you. And Cain saw God's warning and said, I'm good, and headed the other way. You know what I mean? It was almost like he was like, there's no, there's, there's no punishment for the wicked. There's no judge. There's no reward. God doesn't mean it. The second example is Balaam. Won't go into this in detail, but Balaam is basically a prophet for hire. And God tells Balaam to say one thing, and a king offers him money to say the different thing. And so Balaam's caught between these two, and he says, "Uh, I'm going to split the difference. I'm going to kind of say what God says, and I'm going to say what the king says enough to get the cash, and I'm going to go this way down the middle. 
And that's what Jude says here is he says, they abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error. The third group, they perished in Korah's rebellion. Korah and this other guy back in the time of Moses, they come up to Moses and Aaron and they're like, hey, y'all are priests? We the priests now. We want to be priests. Who gives y'all authority? And basically God said, hey, y'all step away from those guys, all right? And he swallows their families and their tents with the earth and then he burns these guys with fire. Woe to them. They walked in the way of Cain, abandoned themselves for the sake of gain. To Balaam's error, they perished in Korah's rebellion. What Jude is saying about the wolves in our churches, he says, like Cain, they reject God's warnings. The wolves in our churches, like Balaam, they choose money over obedience. Like Korah, they rebel against authority. What's this going to look like in our church? Claiming to be Christian, some people will reject God's warnings, and they'll preach, God doesn't really mean it. God's not really going to judge you for our sin. God's all love. How are the wolves going to look? They're going to choose money over obedience, and they're going to preach it even subtly. If you're walking with the Lord, you're going to be rich. That's not true. They reject God's authority and the authority over the church, and they'll preach it even subtly. If you see this sort of behavior in the church, you might not be looking at a believer. You might be looking at a wolf. All right, last bit. He gives these last little snapshots of warnings they're two sets of three all right these these wolves these are hidden reefs at your love feast they feast with you without fear they're shepherds feeding themselves waterless clouds swept along by winds fruitless trees in late autumn twice dead uprooted wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever pause here why is jude spending so much time on this because you think about this. Why does our nation spend billions of dollars annually on counterterrorism? They're hard to find. They try to stay hidden. Like terrorists aren't wearing a shirt that says terrorist, you know? Like they try to look like us and talk like us and act like us so they can infiltrate and destroy. And basically, it's the same with these false teachers. What Jude is doing is being like, look close, look close, look close. Here's how they're going to talk, here's how they're going to act. Because he's saying they may look like a pastor standing up and saying things that don't line up with the Bible. They may look like the folks you shake hands with at the door, the folks you go to lunch with, the folks you eat the Lord's Supper next to. That's where he's going. Look at these quick two sets of three. They're hidden reefs at your love feast. The love feast was part of like in, in this day, like they took the Lord's Supper. At the, Lord, at the love feast. And he's saying they're hidden reefs. They're rocks below the surface that can cause shipwreck. You'd avoid the rocks above surface. It's, the, water, it's the, the rocks below the surface that are dangerous. They're hidden. What he's saying is Jude's saying, these are folks that would sit next to you at the Lord's Supper. Douglas Moo says this, by continuing to participate in this, they pose a real danger to other believers who might be emboldened by their example to think one could remain a Christian while following such a libertine lifestyle. They're sitting right next to us, and we might be, led astray thinking well he's worshiping God and sleeping around he says it's cool love is love God wants me to be happy second example shepherds feeding themselves he's saying these false teachers are doing the exact opposite of what they should be doing shepherds take care of sheep they don't feed themselves waterless clouds they look refreshing but they're empty fruitless trees in late autumn autumn is too late to bear fruit Wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame. Y'all been to the beach, you've seen a hard wave crash, and then that, that sand, poof, it foams up. And he's saying that they're chaotic, they're unpleasant, but what they're dredging up is their own shame from the bottom, their, their gross lifestyle. It just becomes evident. Last one, wandering stars. If you, if you go out tonight and you see a wandering star, that ain't no star. That is a satellite. That is an airplane. That is Elon Musk doing something. <laughs> Stars, they're fixed beacons of navigation. You know what I mean? What he's saying is these false teachers, they drift with our culture because they're not fixed on God's word. They purposefully lead people astray. They look like something you can navigate to, and then they lead you astray. Here's what Jude is telling us about false teachers. That's the end of it. What do we learn? 
false teachers, wolves that are attacking your seventh grade girls. The wolves are going to act out of instinct and feeling alone. If it feels good, it's right. They're going to say that God's grace is here to let you act sexually however you want. They're going to reject authority and do anything for cash. They're in the church to try to lead you to think this way. Man, you think about it. How many people are led away from Christianity by sound arguments? Not a lot. How many people are led away from Christianity because they want to behave a different way? A lot. How many people are led away by teaching that allows them to behave how they want to? A ton. You know, your pastor's not just going to stand up and be like, hey, uh, change plans, guys. Uh, you know, Jesus isn't God, and you can sleep with whoever you want. It's going to be a subtle shift where enemies from within are joined to enemies from without. It's a merging, it's a drifting, but it's purposeful. Here's what I think this passage does. There's wolves among the sheep. This passage helps us to recognize these people, and it calls us to take action. The next sermon tonight is going to tell us how. This passage is take action. There's wolves. Tonight is going to be how to do it. But let me just give a quick commercial in closing. You're shepherds. I love you guys. And I love what y'all do. I love what y'all are called to. We're called to the same charge. Second Timothy says this, I charge you in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. For time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching but have itching ears. They'll accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. But as for you, always be sober-minded. Endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. What a charge. He says to you, by the presence of God, by the judgment of God, by the coming of God, by the kingdom of God, preach the word. It is a huge privilege what we get to do. We get to be God's ambassadors to ninth grade boys. But it is a huge responsibility because of how impressionable these kids are. But let me tell you this. You're not first and foremost a minister. You're first and foremost a son or daughter of God. You are called, beloved, and kept. You're a disciple. And I'm going to tell you, you're not going to be able to speak to hearts deeply if your heart hasn't been spoken to by the word. We have to be students of the word. Me too, I have to be a student of the word. If I'm going to stand up here and preach God's words to you, it better be changing me on the inside. I mean, that's what students want to hear. They, didn't, they don't come to your youth group to hear John Piper. They don't come to your youth group to hear a comedian or an eloquent speaker. What they want to see is a man or a woman whose life is being changed by Jesus. If you will wear these great truths and be convicted and then just get out of the way and show them Jesus. If you can do that, you're protecting your flock. You're giving them an example, something to shoot for. And I tell you, as the more you show them Jesus, the more they're going to be able to detect false teaching. They'll be able to sniff out a wolf, but they won't know exactly how to handle it. But when they hear somebody preach, you can do whatever you want to with your body. They're going to go, oh, I don't know. They hear somebody say, your happiness is more important than your holiness. They're going to go, I don't, that doesn't seem right. An alarm is going to sound. They're going to say, I'm going to have to check that against the Bible. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's success in your ministry. Contend for the faith. Be able to identify false teaching. Protect the flock. Give them Jesus.